So as we now begin to look at the contents of the book of Exodus, uh, we find the story begins, as I mentioned at the beginning of our last lecture, uh, some generations after Joseph has died. How many generations after, we don't know. Might only be one generation later or two, but uh, there's a new Pharaoh in town. And he is not like the Pharaoh who had been so generous and favorable toward Joseph. Uh, he is threatened by the presence of a growing Hebrew population within his borders. Uh, they are of a different race and therefore don't, not necessarily going to be reliable allies in future conflicts. So he felt like the best thing to do is to disempower them <coughs> and make slaves of them. Uh, so he put them under hard bondage where they had, to, they had taskmasters with whips and stuff that made them just work uh, to build buildings. They had to make the building materials, had to make the bricks, and then they had to assemble them. And, and it was, uh, I suppose, almost everybody's seen movies about uh, the Exodus, whether it was you know, the, ten, the movie The Ten Commandments or whatever. Mm -hmm. You see these people working under hard bondage, and that's probably fairly realistic how it was. Mm -hmm. um, however, even when they were put under hard bondage, they continued to multiply. I think Pharaoh's first thought was if they make them work too hard, they won't have time to multiply, but they did anyway. Um, so he came up with a second plan to, to diminish their population, and that was there were certain Egyptian midwives who served the Hebrew women, um, and the names of the midwives are given, Shifra and Pua are their names, and they were commanded by Pharaoh, when you are attending to the birth of Israelite babies, if it's a girl, baby, you can let it live. If it's a male, kill it. And apparently, his intention was that you kill it discreetly. In other words, don't let the Hebrews see you kill their baby. You likely get yourself killed by them if you do that. But, but of course, when the babies come out, you can kind of, you know, discreetly strangle it or something like that, so that it, uh, it, it can it can appear that the baby was uh, stillborn. Is the idea. And the midwives feared God, the Bible says, and so they didn't obey Pharaoh's orders about this. They, they let the male babies as well as the female babies survive. Now, they had to answer to Pharaoh for that, and he called them on the carpet about it. And they said, well, you know, Pharaoh, you have to understand the, the Hebrew women are different than Egyptian women. Egyptian women are pampered and not in good shape. These Hebrew women are hardy women, and they bear their babies real fast. The labor goes fast, and, and the baby's born before we can get there. Now, this is probably true in some cases, probably half-truth. Obviously, they were not telling him that they were, in fact, defying him. But uh, it, there probably was true in some measure. There probably were times when the babies were born without the midwives there, and they could call, and that is the reason. And so they didn't get into trouble. But um, it also it, it suggests, of course, that, that what Pharaoh had in mind for them was to kill the baby in the process of it being born, to make it seem stillborn. Because if they got there and the baby was already born, they weren't allowed to just kill it right there. You know, it had to look like an accident or something. So they that excuse, I guess, got them off the hook. Now, some people say that the midwives lied, uh, and they give this an example of why it's sometimes necessary to lie save lives. You know, Rahab lying about the spies is another example is often given. Excuse me. But uh, we don't know if it was a lie. It might have been a half truth. They certainly weren't telling the whole truth to the Pharaoh. But the, the Bible says that God favored the midwives for this. They defied the Pharaoh's orders and God it says built them houses which probably means built their families. A house can mean a household. So the midwives, under God's blessing, apparently had a lot of children of their own and, and you know, blessed families. Now, the interesting thing about that particular story is that, in general, the Bible indicates that people should obey the government. Paul says that in Romans 13. Peter says that, 1 Peter 2, that we should obey the government officials, but not in all respects. There are times when government officials may order you to do terrible things. If you were a Nazi soldier, and told to you know, mow down a truckload of Jews you know, who had done nothing wrong, that would be an order you should defy. Uh, we're not supposed to obey evil orders. 
Now, we are supposed to obey evil rulers if they're not telling us to do evil things. There are evil, like Paul, when he wrote that we should obey the government authorities. At the time, Nero was the emperor. Paul was writing to Romans, whose emperor was Nero, who was a very evil man. But Paul and Peter both would suggest that evil rulers are nonetheless rulers, and we should obey them, but not when obedience then would involve us in doing something wrong. So that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were told to bow down to a statue, and they couldn't do that and be good Jews, so they were thrown in the fire furnace. Daniel was told not to pray to anyone except Darius for 30 days. He couldn't obey that order, so he was thrown to the lion's den. The apostles were told by the Sanhedrin, which is the Supreme Court of their country, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. And they said, we have to obey God rather than man. So you do have cases in the Bible where people are disobedient to the authorities, like these midwives, and God blesses them for it. So what is, this means is while there is a general requirement that godly people should obey legitimate authorities, uh, there is such a thing as legitimate civil disobedience too, because the orders are unlawful or the orders are immoral, that Christians have to take a stand, sometimes being thrown to dens of lions or fire furnaces for it. It means you have to take your risks. Now, these midwives didn't suffer anything for their disobedience to Pharaoh, as far as we know, and God blessed them. But they were a good example uh, that states that God said, God, it says in the Word of God, that God blessed them. They were, he was glad that they took the side of the Israelites and disobeyed the Pharaoh. Anyway, around this time, Pharaoh said, okay, what we're going to have to do then, if we can't kill these babies at birth, we're going to just kill them after they're born. So he said, every baby who's under three years old has got to be thrown into the river and drowned, every Hebrew baby. And apparently that was carried out to a large extent. But we read in chapter 2 of a particular baby, Moses, who was born in that time period and who was to be thrown into the river. And he was thrown in the river, but not so as to drown. He was, <laughs> his mother made a basket that was watertight that would float and stuck him in the river in it. Technically, she put her baby in the river like you're supposed to, but he didn't die there. Now, he had a 12-year-old sister named Miriam, and we'll later learn he had, a, he had a, a brother, an older brother named Aaron, who apparently was old enough not to be under that particular dictator. Uh, just a question to you. Why did Pharaoh decide to kill a male and a female? I think, I think because his main concern was about their involvement in military actions. Um, at the beginning of there in chapter 1, it says the Pharaoh said, these people scare me because if we're ever invaded, they may take the side of our enemies and fight against us. So it seems like it was uh, the threat of uh, military opposition from the Hebrews that he feared. Women in those days didn't fight in the military, so uh, he didn't mind there being a lot of Jewish women. After all, Jewish women sometimes are pretty women, and the Egyptians might want to marry them. You know, might want them for themselves. But, um, but, he, did, he wanted to keep the potential fighting forces of the Hebrews to a minimum. And that would be taking out the boys and not the girls. Yeah. But um, for him, as an interest to keep the nation small, yeah, you'd it would think, be much yeah. wiser to kill them. I understand, yeah. I mean, you'd think that killing the women would be a good way to keep the population low because it's the women that have the babies. Uh, and after all, it doesn't take a lot of men to impregnate a lot of women, you know, especially in a time where there's polygamy and so forth. You can kill all the men but one and still have all the women get pregnant, <laughs> you know. So I understand your, your statement. It's correct. I mean, he was concerned with their population, but it wasn't just their population. It was the population of males that he was concerned about. Uh, and so all the male babies were to be thrown in the river. That's a good question. And uh, I think the answer is found in, <clears throat> in the fact that he had a military concern not uh, population per se concern. Yeah, I, I don't think he minded if there were a lot of Jewish women um, because, I mean, that increases the general population of Egypt and for, uh, you know, for a nation to have a lot of people is good economically. And even militarily, if the, if, if the Jewish men were too few and most Jewish women couldn't find Jewish husbands, they'd probably marry Egyptian men and then their children would be Egyptians, you know, so I, I imagine that's how he was thinking about it. Uh, 
He's not here to ask, but uh, I, think, I think we could probably assume that he thought that way. So Moses had a, a brother who was three years older than him, Aaron, and a sister 12 years older than him, Miriam. We only encounter them pretty much later, except that Miriam, who remains unnamed in the early part of the story, is assigned by her mother to watch the baby in the basket in the river. And they must have strate strategically done this, or at least God did, the baby happened to be in the river where Pharaoh's daughter happened to regularly go and, and bathe herself. And, and so uh, the baby started crying when she was there. She, her heart went out to the baby. She said, oh, this is a Hebrew baby. Uh, I want to keep it. Mm -hmm. And Miriam, who was there and you know, watching it, came up and said, oh, uh, if you need someone to nurse the baby for you, I know a Hebrew woman who will do that for you. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And so Pharaoh's daughter hired Moses' own mother to nurse him and keep him and raise him up to a point until he was weaned, which is pretty cool because here the Egyptian government ordered his death. Now the Egyptian government is supporting him financially and uh, his mother to take care of him. But when he was weaned, he had to go and live in the palace of Pharaoh. And there, uh, according to the book of Acts, when Stephen is telling the story about this in Acts chapter 7, he says that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So he got a good education. Josephus, the Jewish historian, had some sources that we don't have, and he seemed to, he felt that Moses became a military leader also in Egypt as a young man, and that he commanded the southern armies of Egypt, which is possible. We don't know. Josephus is not an inspired writer. He's a Jewish historian who lived at the time of the apostles. Um, so Moses became an important man. Some people say he was you know, the heir to the throne of Egypt, but there's, that's not very likely. Pharaoh probably had many daughters and sons too. We don't know much about who this Pharaoh is. We can only guess. By the way, our question was asked in our last session, you know, why is the Pharaoh not named? And I think the question implied was it perhaps because of what I was, I was saying in that lecture that you know, nations don't like to record things that are embarrassing to their kings. So maybe because it was an embarrassment to the Pharaoh, he didn't want to be named. But of course, uh, this was not written by Egyptians. This was written by Moses, and he wouldn't mind embarrassing the Pharaoh by name. He doesn't give the Pharaoh's name. There are several Pharaohs in the story. There's the Pharaoh that was there who elevated Joseph. There's the Pharaoh that came up later who didn't know Joseph. That Pharaoh later died while, while Moses was in Midian. And uh, Moses came back, there's a new pharaoh, and that's the one that had the ten plagues and, and the exodus occurred. None of these pharaohs are named for us. And it may just be God's way of saying God values people differently than man does. The midwives are named. These are no doubt Egyptian slave women, you know. Shifra and Pua, they're remembered by name. The pharaoh, the ruler of the world at the time, his name is not given. Uh, it just may be God's way of saying, you know, I value people on a different basis than the world. It's certainly any worldly historian would write the king's name and would probably not mention the name of lesser characters like the midwives. But, but God reserves the honor of the name of the midwives and not even the honor of the name of Pharaoh. So we don't know which Pharaoh or even Pharaoh's daughter it was. But um, apparently God felt that was not the most important thing for us to know. The important thing to know is that the Pharaoh was the kind of person he was. The exact identity of him is not the important thing. Mm -hmm. He apparently allowed his daughter to take Moses in. Um, and so Moses, if, not, if he was not really in line for inheriting the throne of the Pharaoh, which I think probably not, he was nonetheless raised with great privilege in the royal family. And um, what happened is once he grew up, and he was about 40 years old, he, we don't know what his responsibilities were in the government there, but he went out to kind of see his fellow Hebrews uh, who were slaves. Now, he knew they were his fellow Hebrews. How he knew this, we don't know. But, but uh, many times babies in the ancient world were not fully weaned until they were three or even five years old. It seems strange to us to see a woman nursing a baby who's five years old, but in some third world countries, that's not so unusual. Yes, Peter. Um I just have a question to Moses' lineage. It yeah. says he's from the tribe of Levi. Yes. Um, but the tribe of Levi in Genesis 41 is cursed by uh, well, the, Jacob. Like. The tribe of Levi is not so much cursed by Jacob. It's just they, they are deprived of the birthright. Okay. 
Yeah, see, Reuben and Levi and Simeon, who are the oldest sons of Jacob, all were bypassed and not given the birthright. Instead, Judah, you know, was the next in line. <laughs> and it was because they did bad things. But that didn't mean there was no one from those lines who ever were important people. It just means that they didn't have the birthright. So Moses, yeah, Moses seems like he's the ruler of the people, but he's really more like a prophet. Moses was never their king. He never had royal honors or wanted them. He was more like God's prophet. God was their king, and he was the spokesman. And a prophet could come from any tribe. You know, they weren't the rulers. The rulers had to come from Judah, and I think that's probably what you're pointing yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Moses was never considered to be the ruler, per se, like a king. Uh, and neither were the judges who came after him. It wasn't until Saul that Israel had a king. And he wasn't even from the tribe of Judah, but David was. And that's, that's where the legitimate kingship began. Um, so Moses goes out to observe the plight of his fellow Hebrews. Probably he knew they were his brethren because his mother raised him until he was weaned. And that could have been when he was three, four, or five years old. A kid can learn a lot from his mom in that period of time. And very probably his mother, while she weaned him, while she nursed him, was also telling him about the religion of their ancestors and their plight of their people. She could see the writing on the wall. Her son's divinely been placed in a position of privilege where he could perhaps someday deliver his people. I mean, how could a woman who's part of a slave community, has a baby gets adopted by the royal family, not think in those terms? Hey, when he grows up, he can get us out of this, you know? Uh, and so she probably groomed him the first earliest years of his life to think, you are the one that God is going to use to deliver us. Now, the reason I say that is because on the occasion where he actually killed an Egyptian, that's the first time he went out to really see what was going on with his people. He saw an Egyptian taskmaster whipping and beating unjustly a Hebrew slave. Moses was angry, he looked both ways to see if anyone was looking, and he thought no one was looking, he killed the guy and buried him. Now, when Stephen is telling that story in Acts chapter 7, he says, for Moses thought that his brethren would know that God had sent him to deliver them. In other words, according to Stephen's sermon in Acts 7, when Moses killed that Egyptian, though Exodus doesn't tell us so, Moses was already thinking of himself as the deliverer of his people from Egypt. It was his first act of vindicating his people and rescuing his people, an individual in this case, from oppression. But he saw himself as God's appointed deliverer. And this appoint, this, this, he had never encountered God at this point, personally. So he may have gotten this idea from his mother. Or he may have just figured it out on his own. He lived for 40 years, he could have figured something out like that. Hey, I'm a Hebrew, my people are slaves, I'm, I'm in power, I can do something here. Now, he didn't think of it happening the way it eventually happened. He probably thought that his position in Pharaoh's house was going to somehow serve him to become a deliverer. But he actually didn't become a deliverer until he no longer had that position, until he was totally disempowered. In fact, he was persona non grata and on Pharaoh's hit list. Because the fact that he killed this Egyptian was reported to Pharaoh. Pharaoh was angry and put a hit out on him, ordered him to be killed. So Moses fled, and he went to Midian, which, as we've seen on the map, is pretty far from Egypt. You have to go across what's called the Sinai Peninsula and uh, over to what's now Saudi Arabia. And there he met his wife, and uh, her father was <coughs> the priest of Midian, his name is said to be Jethro in some passages. He's also called Ruel in some passages. He's called Raguel in some. There's a man who's called by three different names in different passages. Jethro is the main name we know him by. And he gave Moses this, one of his daughters to be wife. And Moses spent another 40 years, till he was 80 years old, mm -hmm. just shepherding sheep. Now, we are told in Genesis that shepherds were an abomination to the Egyptians. <laughs> Moses was an Egyptian by upbringing and culture. And here he has to spend 40 years doing that which is an abomination to his upbringing, tending dirty old sheep. Not that New Zealanders would be against it, <laughs> but Egyptians would be. And uh, so he spent his first 40 years in Pharaoh's house 
learning how important he was and how much potential he had to save his people, no doubt feeling pretty confident about his prospects. The next 40 years he spent being humble, being nothing, being insignificant, tending sheep alone in the desert. And it was at the end of that period, when he was 80 years old, that God appeared to him in the burning bush <clears throat> and told him, I'm going to uh, you know, send you to Pharaoh and tell him to release my people. Now, at this time, Moses no longer had any aspirations of delivering his people from Egypt. When he was in a position of power in Egypt, he thought that was a pretty realistic idea. He even started to implement it when he killed the Egyptian. But now, 40 years later, he's been deflated. He's totally without self-esteem here. And when God says, you're the man who's going to deliver my people, Moses says, I really think you have the wrong guy. <laughs> Tried that. Didn't work. You know, I, and now who am I? He says, who am I that I should speak to Pharaoh? And God said, doesn't matter who you are, I will be with you. And God gave him, uh, Moses kept making excuses not to do it. And God kept saying, no more excuses. You're the guy I'm going to choose. Finally, he said, if you, if you don't think you're a good speaker, you can have your brother Aaron be your spokesman. <laughs> so you don't have, to, don't have to do this alone. So Moses finally caved in to God's pressure and went and told his father Jethro he had to go back. And he took his wife and his baby, who had not been circumcised, as we find out. And with this very strange little story, as he's traveling from Midian back to Egypt, in Genesis chapter 4, and uh, in verse 26, or earlier, verse 24, this is while they're traveling from Midian to Egypt, so he's going to go and confront Pharaoh. It says in Exodus 4.24, On the journey, when Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah, his wife, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She threw the foreskin at Moses' feet and said, What a blood-smeared bridegroom you are to me. Now, then the Lord left him alone. Now, it's a strange story. Here, God, has called, God has called him to go to Egypt as a prophet and, his, and a spokesman. He starts to obey and starts going, and God meets him and wants to kill him. What for? Well, obviously we're not told what for until we see what Zipporah did. Zipporah circumcised the son, and God let him go. That is, God had this against Moses, that Moses had not circumcised his son. Now, what we would see in this <clears throat> is that Moses, as a Jew, knew he was supposed to circumcise his son, but hadn't done it. Therefore, there was an area of glaring disobedience in Moses' life. And here he's going to a pagan, going to command the pagan to obey God, but he, a Jew, hasn't obeyed God. It's like <clears throat> the preacher telling Pharaoh, you've got a moat in your eye, but he's got a beam in his own eye. He's got to get the beam out of his own eye before he can get the moat out of Pharaoh's eye. So God called him to confront Pharaoh, but Moses would have no divine authority to stand before Pharaoh if Moses himself had this area of compromise in his life where he was still not obeying God. So this had to be settled. Now when it says God sought to kill him, this is very unclear what this means. Many scholars think it just means he got really sick and it, and it was really God afflicting him with maybe a high fever. He almost died until the, the son was circumcised and then the fever left him. It's possible that God even appeared in a human form. He did with Jacob. He wrestled with Jacob all night. <coughs> Uh, it's possible that God came in a human form like he did to Abraham and actually was like wrestling with him in a life and death struggle. It's hard to know. We don't know exactly what this meant, whether God was visibly present or whether circumstances like a sudden sickness were understood to be God's judgment. In any case, Moses' life was in danger. What's interesting is his wife instantly knew what had to be done. She knew what the issue was. Probably Moses did too. This was not, I mean, she circumcised the son, but she was not happy about it, obviously. She says, you're a bloody husband to me. What's, what, what's the backstory to all this? Well, different people have come up with different ideas about the backstory, but what it sounds to me is this. First of all, the fact that Zipporah knew what the issue was right away means that this had come up before. In my opinion... Now, by the way, in the book of Numbers, it says Moses was the meekest man in all the earth, which means not self-assertive. In my opinion, when the child had been born, Moses probably had wanted to circumcise it on the eighth day, but hadn't. Why hadn't he? You'd think he would. But maybe that his wife's support had found it to be a disgusting practice and said, you're not going to do that to my son. I could imagine having that reaction. 
you're not a Jew. I mean, you're not going to, you know, torture my son, cut him up, you know. <laughs> and if Moses was a very compliant husband, he might have said, oh, well, okay. And he obeyed his wife instead of God. Perhaps after a bit of arguing. It looks like this was a matter of contention between them. Because she did the deed, but she complained to him about it. Okay, you got your way, right? You know? Uh, now, I have heard another view that she was angry because Moses had failed to circumcise his son, and she had to end up doing it. So there's, there's one, uh, one explanation that makes Moses the, the bad guy entirely. And another makes you know, Zipporah maybe not so much that she was the one who opposed the circumcision. In any case, the fact that she did it but found it disgusting and opposed it suggests that she didn't like it. And uh, so it's possible that she hadn't liked it earlier, but now found that she couldn't continue to have her way about it, so she circumcised the child and complained about it. It's not entirely clear what all is the backstory, but it was clear, it is clear, that God was holding it against Moses that he had not done what he should do, and he wasn't going to let him confront Pharaoh until he got that straightened out. And frankly, you know, you guys are, some of you are going to be missionaries. Uh, might be that God may bring something up. He hopefully doesn't try to kill you, but uh, there might be areas of disobedience in your life that you're kind of ignoring that God may want you to get settled before you go and confront other people about God. Uh, pretty much you have to have to be clean before God yourself, have a clear conscience before God, before you can have any real authority and power to speak in his name to other people. And that's what Moses was having squared away in his life right now. So he went on. Now, what's interesting, we never read about Zipporah again until after the Exodus. What's interesting, we have all the confrontations with Pharaoh, the ten plagues, the Passover, the pass through, going through the Red Sea, the moving to Sinai. All that is told, and Zipporah is not there, apparently. And after Moses has come out of Egypt and he's free, Jethro, his father-in-law, and Zipporah come to visit him. And it says Moses had sent her away. Now when did he send her away? Probably here. This conflict, they probably by mutual agreement thought, you know, we're not very like-minded here. I'm going home to dad. Moses is gone. You know, I mean, they, they actually separated over this. They did, she did visit him again, and whether she came back and stayed with him after that or not, I don't know. We later read in Numbers that he married an Ethiopian woman. Uh, so, Maybe his wife just left him for good. Maybe he divorced her. Um, we don't know. But he, he later had another wife. So there's things that are not explained. But you can kind of see that some kind of piecing together of these data can be done, at least speculatively. So he ends up going without his wife and kid. He meets, Pharaoh, he meets Aaron, and they go to confront Pharaoh. Now, God has given Moses some signs to convince Pharaoh that he's somebody uh, to be reckoned with. First, Moses tells the Jews, I'm here to rescue you. God sent me. And he shows them the signs. He throws his rod down, it becomes a snake. He pours water out, it becomes blood. And uh, this impresses the Jews, and they thank God that he sent a deliverer. And then Moses goes to confront Pharaoh. He does the same signs, but Pharaoh has magicians who can do the same thing. And so Pharaoh's unimpressed, and he says, Now, you Jews, you must not be working hard enough. I must not be giving you enough to do. You're talking about wanting to go worship your God and be free. Uh, I'm going to have to give you some more work. So you have to produce the same number of bricks as before, but I'm not going to give you the straw. You have to get that for yourself. And that's, that meant the Israelites had to work much harder, and they got beaten for not producing, and they came and complained to Moses and said, Hey, thanks for being such a good deliverer, man. You know, you can't help us out. It's gotten only worse now. And Moses complained to God, said, hey, what's up with that? I thought I was supposed to, you're supposed to deliver these people, and it's only gotten worse. And God says, just watch. We'll see what we'll do to Pharaoh now. And there was a series then of ten plagues. These plagues, the first of which was the whole Nile and all those freshwater sources being turned to blood. By the way, we're told that blood is an abomination to the Egyptians. So what would they normally be sustained by? The, the Nile River was the source of water, not only for the Egyptians, but I mean, for their, for, their, for their crops and for feeding the whole region outside of Egypt too, sometimes. 
And so the Nile was, you know, it's largely a desert region out there apart from the river. When it turns blood and you can't drink the water, uh, you're in a lot of trouble, really. The Bible says when the water turned to blood, the people would dig around for fresh water. I guess they were able to find some fresh water when they dug deep enough, but they survived for a while. We don't know how long it was red. Uh, some people think it wasn't literal blood. Some say there actually was, around that time, a cave-in of some uh, mountains upstream from Egypt in the Nile, and, uh, and a lot of red mud uh, filled the river, and so it, it looked blood red. To say that it turned to blood doesn't have to be taken literally. After all, the Bible says at, at some places, the sun will be dark and the moon shall be turned to blood. It doesn't mean the moon's going to literally turn into you know, red and white corpuscles. You know, it's, it's not going to be liquid. It means it's going to be blood red. To say it'll turn to blood just means it's going to be red. So to say the river turned to blood, I don't know if we have to necessarily assume it's literal blood, though it could have been. God could do it. I don't want to diminish the miracles. But it, just that the river would turn blood red would be enough to be the sign that Moses gave that is going to happen. What happened is that Moses would confront the Pharaoh and say, if you don't let the people go, God's going to do this. And the Pharaoh would say, well, I'm not going to let them go. So Pharaoh would go out and right, Moses would go out and raise his staff to the Lord or whatever he did, raise his hands and pray. And then this thing would happen. Then, then Pharaoh would call Moses and say, say make it go away. And Moses would do so. And then the Pharaoh still wouldn't comply. He'd harden his heart. And, um, and then Moses had to threaten another plague. Okay, so make a plague of frogs everywhere, in your houses, in your ovens, in your beds. Frogs everywhere. And then, of course, uh, Pharaoh would call Moses in and say, take them away. And so Moses would do that. And the Pharaoh would harden his heart again, and there'd have to be another plague, flies. Biting flies <clears throat> all over the place. And there were 10 of these plagues, including boils that came on people and on beasts, hail that was so destructive it destroyed every plant, locusts that at another point destroyed every plant. Now, the fact that the whole crops were destroyed several different times, there was a barley crop and there's a wheat crop, means this was, this was taking place over a period of time because a crop would be destroyed by hail or locusts or something, and then later on the crop would be destroyed again. It must be new crops. Uh, there is some reason to believe the series of plagues perhaps took as long as a year to run their course, so it wasn't just boom, 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 ten consecutive days, you had ten plagues. It was spread out over the agricultural year, it would appear. Nonetheless, it was within a short enough period of time, and always at the command of Moses, that made it very obvious that this was something God, the God of Moses, was doing. And Pharaoh should have complied. Now, the Bible keeps referring to Pharaoh's heart being hardened. In the New Testament, in Romans 9, Paul mentions God hardening Pharaoh's heart. And he even says, God hardens whom he wills. And he has mercy on whom he wills. Now, there are some people who have taken that statement of Paul quite differently than I think Paul means. It's certainly different than what he said. And they've suggested that all human beings on the earth are either uh, saved, the ones that God shows mercy to, or they are hardened by God, and they can't be saved. This view is, of course, the Calvinist view that God foreordains before the world who will be saved and who will not. The idea being that once you're born, it's already decided, even before you're born, it's decided whether you're going to heaven or hell. According to this view, you've been predestined for eternity to go to one place or the other, you don't really have any real choice in the matter. You feel like you do, but all the choices you make are really being governed by God's sovereignty and you, you, if you reject Christ because he ordained that you do that, if you receive Christ because he ordained it. And, and Romans 9 is often used as a proof of that. And they say, well, see, Paul said, God shows mercy on whom he'll show mercy, and he hardens whom he'll harden. Well, and, and then the Calvinist says, so that means all people are either the ones that God shows mercy to or the people he hardens. Romans 9? Romans 9, yeah. It's a, it's a discussion in Romans 9 uh, that is very commonly appealed to in discussions about uh, the Calvinist points. And th that portion of it begins really when it talks about Jacob and Esau in the womb. God chose Jacob over Esau. We talked about that a uh, while ago in verse uh, 10. But he starts talking about Pharaoh and hardening Pharaoh and so forth. Um, 
for example, he says uh, in verse 16, so then it is not of him who wills or of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, that my name may be declared in the, all the earth. That's what actually God, through Moses, said to Pharaoh at the time of these plagues. Then verse 18, therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. So it refers to Pharaoh being hardened as an example of those that God wants to be hardened. And then God, of course, has mercy on who he wants to also. Now, one thing I'd point out is Paul has not said that all people in the world fall into one of those two categories. That there are those that God has shown mercy to, and the others are all hardened. He's simply saying that God is sovereignly able to show mercy to whoever he wants to, and he's also able to harden whoever he wants to. Now, in the Bible, he doesn't harden very many people. He hardened Pharaoh, he hardened a few other people at different times in, in, in Israel's history, you about God hardening somebody's heart. It was exceptional. Not everyone who's an unbeliever has been hardened by God. It's, Paul's not suggesting that's so. And by the way, when he says God will have mercy on whom he has mercy, sometimes you say he doesn't really have to have a reason, he just shows mercy unilaterally. But the Bible doesn't say that. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. God shows mercy on people who are merciful. The Bible says he, uh, he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So there are conditions in humans that qualify them to receive mercy and grace. If you're humble, if you're merciful, the Bible says you'll receive mercy and grace. It's not unilateral for no reason, as some people think it is. And also, when God hardens somebody, he doesn't do it for no reason. Pharaoh, by the way, was not hardened from birth. He was not simply because he was not one of the elect. God had him born hardened. He, was, he had opportunities to make decisions before God began to harden him. The Bible does speak about God hardening him, and it talks about him hardening himself. Both, both statements are made. But the point is that God didn't even begin to harden him until he was already a wicked man. The hardening of Pharaoh was in order to prevent him from repenting and getting out from under the judgments of God that were taking place through a course of ten plagues. God wanted all ten plagues to come. He didn't want the man to weasel out of it before then. Any man left to himself would be smart enough to say after the first or second plague, okay, I see what you can do. I don't do any more. I'll let the people go. But the Bible would say God hardened his heart. And sometimes it would say Pharaoh hardened his heart. Both, both terms are used. The point is that God was not letting him repent because he was under God's judgment. He was not under God's judgment because he was just kind of unconditionally elected to be lost. He was under God's judgment because he was a wicked man. He was an oppressor. He was a tyrant. He killed babies. You know, he was a bad man. And so when people are bad men, God can judge them whatever way he wants to. He can send an angel. Like he, he judged Herod in Acts chapter 12. He had an angel of the Lord strike him so that worms ate him and he died. He struck down Ananias and Sapphira with a word from Peter. Uh, there are other people. Nadab and Abihu, the two priests, were consumed by fire from the presence of the Lord. God can judge wicked men however he wants to. He judged Pharaoh by hardening his heart. It's one of many kinds of judgments that God does on some people, not everybody. Paul is not saying everybody is either saved or hardened. And that's not what Paul's saying. He's just saying that God has sovereign power to do what he wants. If he wants to harden someone, he can harden them. If he wants to show mercy, he can. But he's not saying he does it for no reason. See, the Calvinist doctrine actually is that God has no particular reason that we can discern. That you are chosen to be saved through nothing God sees in you. Or you chose to be lost through nothing God sees in you. God has foreordained it before you were born. And so, uh, and they use this verse, but Paul's not saying that, TJ. Uh, yeah, sweet. Uh, do you think it's necessary that when uh, in Exodus and then later when Paul is quoting it in Romans 9, that when he speaks about this hardening, that it is forever afterwards? Or is it just for this specific moment in time where... God is judging um, Pharaoh, and so his heart is hardened in this moment in time because of whatever. Does that mean, let's say he doesn't die in the Nile River, that he's going to be hardened forever? Or mm -hmm. is this just an example of him being hardened for a season, I guess? Well, that's, that's a good and pertinent question. Once God hardened him, does that mean, okay, from, for, for the rest of your life you're hardened? Not necessarily, because each time uh, a plague came, Pharaoh had to re-harden his heart, or God had to re-harden it. It says, and God hardened his heart so he didn't do it. Um, 
And then the time came where he did obey. Yeah. He, after the uh, death of the firstborn, mm -hmm. he said, okay, go, go. And, uh, and then after he went, it says, then he hardened his heart again. So obviously the hardening of the heart is not like a constant condition mm -hmm. that you know, for a lifetime he's a hardened man. Rather, at a certain point in his life, he comes under God's judgment, which means God hardens him at, at times when he would normally, if he's in his right mind, would cave in, yeah. would say, I don't want any more of these plagues. I repent. But to prevent that from happening, God would harden him at strategic points so that he would remain obstinate. But he did come to a place where he ceased to be obstinate briefly, and then he hardened his own heart again later on. Whether he died in the Red Sea or not, we don't really know. It's possible that he did. If he was at the front of his armies, uh, he died in the Red Sea. We're not told uh, whether he was or not. But um, if so, then he probably died a hardened man. But the fact that God hardened him for this series of plagues would not in itself mean for the rest of his life he has to be have a hardened heart. This was a hardening. It was for a purpose, for these plagues to run their course. Once they'd run their course, God could leave them alone, you know, once the Israelites were free. We don't, yeah, it's, the hardening of people's hearts, therefore, is not necessarily referring to an irrevocable situation. Brandon? If the goal of the plagues was to free the Hebrews of slavery, why was it so important for all ten plagues to run their course? Well, there's more than, yeah, good point. Why, why was that necessary? Why couldn't he let them go after the first plague? Because there was more than just releasing Israel. God, in releasing Israel, was also intending to judge Egypt, the nation of Egypt. The judgment that came of Pharaoh was owed to him. He was definitely a very evil man. But it was not simply that Pharaoh was bad, but Egypt was bad. And God was judging the nation of Egypt through the hardness of the heart of their ruler. A nation often suffers because of bad choices their rulers make, and that was the case in this case. This was a judgment actually on Egypt, and God said uh, that he was actually going to judge all the gods of Egypt. Um, in uh, Exodus 12.12, 12, God is talking to Moses prior to the night of the Passover, and in Exodus 12, 12, he says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. Now, these plagues were against the gods of Egypt. The greatest god of Egypt was the sun, Ra. Well, this, there was a, a plague of darkness where the sunlight was blotted out. The river Nile was one of their gods, too, and it turned to blood, something disgusting of them. Frogs. There was a Hika, the frog god of Egypt. He, he, you know, god made frogs disgusting to the Egyptians by making them everywhere, more than they wanted. Uh, cattle were gods of Egypt, and they had a, a, a disease that came on the cattle and killed them, most of them. Um, even the pharaoh was a god, and his firstborn son was a god. So, I mean, these plagues were not simply making Egypt miserable and destroying its economy, which they did. They were directed in many cases against specific gods of Egypt to show the impotence of those gods compared to God. So God was, that's a good question. You know, why didn't he just let the Israelites go the first time if God just wanted them to be free? He did want them to be free, but he wanted to leave his signature behind on Egypt when they left. Uh, and his signature was a judgment on their false gods. Mm -hmm. So these plagues were directed that way. As you read through the series of plagues, it's kind of interesting because at different points, because Pharaoh's getting tired of these plagues, but he's not quite ready to give in, he calls Moses in to say, okay, uh, so how far away are you going to go? How about if you just go, I'll let you go, but not outside the land. And Moses said, no, nope, we're going further than that. And Pharaoh said, then I'm not going to let you go. Later on, Pharaoh was under more pressure because of the plagues. And he said, okay, Moses, you guys, you can go, but only the men. You have to leave your women and children behind in order to guarantee that you'll come back. And Moses said, no, we're not going without the women and children or anything we have. So M Pharaoh at certain points was trying to compromise and say, I, okay, you want to worship your God, I'll let do it within the land or do it just the men and, uh, or don't take your cattle. Um, but Moses rejected every compromise. And finally Pharaoh, uh, you know, after the firstborn died, Pharaoh said, okay, all of you, just go. Yes? Uh, why did God tell Moses to ask Pharaoh for like three days to sacrifice if like they all knew that they were coming back? 
Right. He said, let us go three days into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our God. Now, it makes it sound like we'll be back in three days, you know, which would be a deception, if that's what he means. I don't think that's what he means. I think he means, let us go a three days journey into the wilderness, which is out of Egypt's boundaries. Out, or let's leave Egypt. You give us, give us three days to get all the way out. Uh, so I don't think he was saying, we're just going to be gone three days, we'll be back. He's saying more like, you need to give us three days uninterrupted to get out of, out of here, you know, and then we'll be, frankly, beyond your reach, is the idea. Um, so I think that's probably what the three days refers to in, in the request. Now, of course, Pharaoh finally agreed, and so the Israelites left, and um, they traveled across the desert. Again, we were looking at the map. How much they covered is hard to say. Uh, they, they couldn't have gotten that far in a day or two. If they're, if they're going this way, they take longer than that. But they had a good head start. And at a certain point, Pharaoh sent his armies after them. And God slowed down the Egyptian armies because he had a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. It was kind of interesting. At the same time, the pillar was a pillar of fire to the Israelites that gave them light at night so they could travel at night. And it, kept, it, it was darkness on the side of the Egyptians, so they couldn't travel. So even though the Israelites probably had not gotten very far before Israel began to send his troops after them, uh, nonetheless, the, Isra the Israelites could travel more, uh, more of the day than the Egyptians could. God prevented the Egyptians from coming through the night, and the Israelites could travel through the night. So they, they would, although the Egyptians would go faster in chariots and horses than the Israelites on foot, the Israelites had more hours of the day they could travel. So it took a while. Eventually the Egyptians caught up with them, but not apparently until they were at the edge of the sea. And then they were trapped and the Egyptians were coming. And uh, that's when God parted the Red Sea. And the Israelites crossed the sea, uh, as I understand it, into Midian or into what's now Arabia. And the waters came down and crushed the Egyptian armies. And so, for the first time in several hundred years, the Israelites were free people. Hardly knew what to do with themselves, but God had plans for them. And so he took them a short journey from where they were to uh, Mount Sinai. That's uh, during the time they were attacked. They were attacked uh, by the Amalekites. Yes? So, yeah, I like got it all about like uh, the different place of the mountain. But are you also stating that the Red Sea was like used to be the other sea? That that name Crossing the Red Sea, I think, was the Gulf of Aqaba. Okay, yes. Yeah. That's just it. Okay. Right. So, um, again, for those who can't see the map very well, the Sinai uh, Peninsula stands between Egypt and Arabia. And it is a peninsula because there's two branches of the Red Sea that fork off on either side of it. One is the Gulf of Suez on the west and the Gulf of Aqaba on the east. And so I'm suggesting the crossing of the Red Sea was crossing the Gulf of Aqaba into Arabia. And that would put them beyond Pharaoh's jurisdiction. Actually, uh, Sinai it was part of Egypt. So, you know, if they crossed into Sinai Peninsula, that's, that's Egyptian territory. That wouldn't really be fully safe. But if they crossed into Arabia, there'd be no more hope of Pharaoh pursuing them. You know, so anyway, that's another factoid. So they were attacked by the Amalekites. Uh, and that's when Moses went up on a mountain he armed the Israelites, apparently with weapons they got from the Egyptians. The Egyptians were seen on the shore of the Sea of, uh, on the Red Sea, and their, their equipment apparently was confiscated by the Israelites so that they could fight now. They had swords and shields and things because the Egyptians had died and their armor was there available and their weapons. So Israel now had weapons, and when the Amalekites attacked them, Moses went on the mountaintop with two other men, Joshua and, or Aaron, excuse me, Aaron and Hur, and uh, they, and he held his hands up in a posture of prayer or surrender to God or whatever. And while his hands were up, the Israelites prevailed against the Amalekites in battle. When Moses got tired and his hands went down, the Amalekites prevailed. So Aaron and Hur sat Moses on a rock and sat by him and they held his hands up all day until the Israelites prevailed. 
And at the end of the time, God made a curse on the Amalekites, that God would have war against them and destroy them. Much later, Saul, the first king, was told by Samuel to go and wipe out the Amalekites in fulfillment of this curse. That was centuries later, actually. But uh, that, that was the first people who attacked Israel after they came out of Egypt were the Amalekites. Then uh, we have Moses. Uh, people were complaining to Moses they didn't have food. Now, they actually had livestock, a lot of livestock. But that was largely so they could offer sacrifices. And, and they didn't want to just eat all their livestock. They needed a breeding stock for generations to come. So they didn't see their livestock as something like, hey, I'm hungry, let's kill our, all our cattle and eat it. Uh, they needed some of it for sacrifices. They needed some of it for breeding stock so they had more cattle later on. So they just didn't, they didn't want to kill their cattle. They may have killed a few now and then, but there's a lot of people. And they couldn't eat meat on a regular basis if they're going to supply it with their own cattle. But they couldn't grow crops either because they're on the move. Living in tents, moving about. So God gave them manna. They complained and wanted food, and God gave them manna, which was a bread-like thing that just came down from heaven and appeared on the ground every morning, which they collected. And apparently they collected as much as they could. They put it in a common pot and measured out an ephah uh, to each person. Uh, so everyone got the same amount. And the Bible says in Exodus 16 that because of that, it says those who gathered little had no lack and those who gathered much had no extra because they, everyone collected what they could and then it was pooled and then given out, measured out the same amount to everybody. Paul actually quotes that in 2 Corinthians as being a, a principle that God has made some Christians richer than others. But those who have gathered much, there's the rich ones, shouldn't necessarily have any extra, and the ones who gather little, the poor ones, shouldn't have any lack. And so he's arguing that the Corinthians who had some money should take up a collection to help out the, the Jewish Christians who didn't, who were poor. So there's a principle there that God gave them with the manna. Uh, in the same section, we have Moses' father-in-law coming to visit him. And his, his father-in-law notices that Moses, this is in chapter 18, that Moses is spending a lot of his time uh, settling disputes between people. In fact, he's sitting in his tent and people are lined up around, around the block waiting to talk to him about their disputes. And his father-in-law says, you're going to wear yourself out. You need to appoint subordinates to do this. And so, and so he followed his father-in-law's instructions and set up uh, leaders of hundreds and of five hundreds and of, I think even of thousands, as we call it, of tens uh, and fifties. And so that the people would go to, let's say if there's a leader of a thousand, if you're one of the thousand, you go to that guy if he can't settle the case, then he'll take it to the next guy who has only 100 under him. If he can't settle it, he can eventually go all the way up to Moses if none of the subordinates were able to handle the case. But it meant that very few cases were brought to Moses and it took that load off of him. That whole thing is described in, in the 18th chapter. At chapter 19, they actually come to Mount Sinai. And eventually Moses goes up on the mountain, leaves Aaron in charge of the people down at the foot of the mountain. And Aaron uh, makes the mistake or the rebellious act of making the golden calf. Now, while Moses is in the mountain, the mountain is on fire, and there's, it's shaking, and it's terrifying. There's thunder and lightning. He disappears up into the smoke and the clouds out of sight. <clears throat> His personal servant, Joshua, goes up the mountain too, but only halfway up. Joshua camps out on the edge of the mountain for 40 days. Moses disappears into the smoke on top and is gone for 40 days. And when Moses comes down, He's got Ten Commandments on stones from God. And Joshua said, hey, I hear noise down in the camp. Sounds like they're having a big party down. Or it sounds like a war. And Moses said, that, that's not the sound of war. That's the sound of a party. And they went down there and they found the people worshiping the golden calf, having an orgy and all this stuff. And so Moses was furious. He threw down the, the stone tablets and broke them. And he uh, straightened out the problem there. Now, the reason this was so bad is that prior to that, God had spoken from the mountain and said, You Israelites, if you'll obey my voice and keep my covenant, you'll be my special people. You'll be a peculiar treasure to me above all the nations. You'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, God was taking these people who had only been a big family. They were never a national entity. When they went into Egypt, under Jacob, it was just a bunch of brothers and, and cousins uh, and you know, grandchildren going in there. When they came out, there were millions of them, but they're still just a big family. But now God says, you could be a nation now, just like Egypt's a nation or these other nations. I'm going to make you a special nation to be my nation, my people, a holy nation. 
but you have to obey my voice and keep my covenant. And they said, okay, we will. So there was an agreement made. It's called the, called the Sinaitic Covenant. Just like marriage is a covenant between a husband and wife, this was a covenant between God and the people. And forever afterward, God regarded it as a marriage. He was regarded as the husband to Israel, and Israel was his wife. And when she worshipped idols, she was like an unfaithful wife, committing adultery against her husband. This is how God viewed him. God, in fact, according to Paul, God created the covenant of marriage to be a picture of God and his people, of Christ and the church. This covenant of marriage between a man and wife is to be a picture of the covenant that God has with his people. And that was the first covenant. Now, Jesus made a new covenant, and that's the covenant by which we're related to God now as his people. But the first covenant was on Mount Sinai, and Israel became the covenant nation, the wife of God at that point. So Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, and they're, they're already committing adultery. They're already worshiping another god. So he breaks the commandments, disciplines them, and goes back up the mountain for another 40 days. He's fasting. He fasted 40 days, came down, broke the commandments, went back up and fasted another 40 days, and got another set of law of tablets. He made the tablets, God engraved them, and came down. Now, God also gave him not only the Ten Commandments, but a bunch of other laws. These are called the Book of the Covenant. They're, the Ten Commandments are in chapter 20 of Exodus. The Book of the Covenant is chapters 21 through 23. And it's a bunch of smaller laws or lesser laws that are more specific. Like the Ten Commandments say, you shall not commit adultery. Or let's put it this way. The Ten Commandments say, you shall, not, you shall honor your father and mother. And these lesser laws is like, if you curse your father or mother, you'll be put to death. If you strike your father or mother, you'll be put to death. And it was taking the general laws of the Ten Commandments and making it into case law, into specific instances. That's called the Book of the Covenant, which is chapters 21 through 23. And the people agreed to this and became God's covenant people. Then God began to go into the tabernacle issue. God had shown Moses a, a, a vision on the mountain of the tabernacle, and he told him to build it like that. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's several chapters giving the details of the tabernacle, and then there's several more chapters describing when the tabernacle was being constructed. And the end of the book is with them erecting the tabernacle, and at the very end of the book, God fills the tabernacle, the glory of God in, a, in smoke fills the tabernacle, and it's so, his presence is so mighty that the priest can't even go in there to, to minister. And so the tabernacle begins to exist, um, and it becomes the shrine where they worship. I'm almost out of time, but I need to say something about the tabernacle. I've mentioned that it is, in fact, a, uh, you know, a type and a shadow of some spiritual things. And I suppose the best way I can deal with it would be, if I can, to just make a real basic picture of it. Uh, you've got uh, three parts of the tabernacle. I'm going to depict them like this. And they will not be to scale, okay? There's... This is a tent, uh, not a tent, a curtained enclosure. There's no roof over it. It's open air. There's a bunch of posts with curtains between them. And, and it makes a, a curtained enclosure whose curtains are uh, well above eye level. And they conceal what's inside unless you come to the gate at the, at the front. Inside this curtained enclosure, which is called the courtyard, there's a building. The building is three times as deep as it is wide. Here's the entrance on this side. This building is called the Tabernacle of Sanctuary. Sanctuary means holy place. And this building is divided into two parts. There's a, a not a wall, but a curtain that goes across here. Though this is not to scale, this curtained area is 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet cube. It's 15 feet tall. 15 feet each dimension. This other part of the building is, of course, 15 feet tall also, and also 15 feet wide, but it's 30 feet deep. So it's like, this is called the holy place, and this is called the holy of holies, okay? The holy place is twice the side of the holy, size of the holy of holies. It is, uh, the building is entered from this side. Now, when this is all about sacrifices. This is all about bringing blood before God. That's what the whole tabernacle was for. And when Israel would bring an animal to sacrifice, he'd come in through the gate here. First thing he would counter is something called the bronze altar. It's described 
and a priest would meet him there. They do a ritual, slitting the animal's throat, draining out the blood, doing what they do, cut it up, and they burn it on this altar. This altar was made of wood but overlaid with bronze. Mm -hmm. And it was the altar of sacrifice, where the animals were sacrificed. As you move closer to the building, there's a, 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 what they call the laver of cleansing, or it's a, a basin of water. The priest who would offer the sacrifice would then go and wash his hands and feet here. And then he could go into the building. To enter the building required you first offer a blood sacrifice and are washed, as the priest would be. Inside the building, there's going to be three pieces of furniture. On the north side, there's a table that has 12 loaves of bread. It's called the table of showbread. On the south side is a lamp with seven branches. It's an oil lamp after which the menorah is uh, modeled. And right here, by the veil, before you go to the Holy Holies, there's another little altar, smaller than this one out here, but it's, it's gold-plated instead of bronze-plated. In fact, all the furniture inside is either solid gold or gold-plated. Everything out here is bronze. So it's bronze outside, gold inside. And this altar is not for animal sacrifices, but for it's for incense. They would sprinkle blood from the sacrifice on there, perhaps, but, they, but it was for burning incense. Now, inside the Holy of Holies was uh, one piece of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, which was a box, a wooden box overlaid with gold. Uh, it's really a chest to contain the Ten Commandments. Eventually, some other things were put in it, too, a, man, a pot of manna, a golden pot of manna, and also Aaron's rod that budded were put in it. But it was mainly the box to carry the Ten Commandments in. It didn't have a, uh, an attached lid, but it had a free-standing lid that was solid gold slab with two cherubim engraved out of gold on top. That gold slab that was on top of the ark was called the mercy seat. So the ark, which was covered with the mercy seat, was in there. Now, the worship of God then was conducted uh, day by day. People brought sacrifices. They'd be sacrificed on this bronze altar. The priest who did the sacrifice would then wash himself and apparently go into, into the uh, building, the holy place, but not into the Holy of Holies. They could only go in there once a year. Mm -hmm. Only the high priest could. Aaron was the high priest. In all later generations, his oldest descendant would be the high priest. All the other Levites, well, not, excuse me, all the other sons of Aaron, he was a Levite, but all the other sons of Aaron would also be priests, but only the oldest would be the high priest. And the high priest, once a year on Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, would go in here and sprinkle blood after a, real, a very special ritual for that day was offered, lots of animal sacrifices. He sprinkled blood on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. And that was to absolve Israel of sins for that year. But they had to do it every year to repeat, to absolve Israel of the sins of another year. Now, this ritual here was done daily. Uh, this ritual was only once a year. So the Holy of Holies was not even entered except once a year. Now there were no windows or, or doors and no artificial light here in the Holy of Holies. The glory of God was the light of it. If, there's, if the glory of God wasn't there, it would be pitch dark. This area was lit by the, by the lamp stand, which was oil lamp. This area was lit by the light of the sun. And there's many things that we can say. The book of Hebrews indicates that the high priest going into the Holy of Holies really is paralleled by Jesus going into the Holy of Holies in heaven when he ascended. Mm -hmm. He passed through the veil of the clouds, out of sight, into heaven itself, where he is interceding for us, like the high priest would sprinkle blood for the people on the mercy seat. Christ is before God, presenting his blood on our behalf. So Christ is the new high priest. His absence, in which we're living, is the Day of Atonement. He went in when he ascended. He comes out when he returns. So Jesus is in the Holy of Holies now. The whole age of the church from the ascension of Christ to his return is the day of atonement, basically. He's interceding for us in the Holy of Holies. This is what the writer of Hebrews tells us. There's something I would say real quick. I've run out of time, but I would say this really quickly, that we can learn something about the knowledge of God just from the whole construction of the tabernacle. Much, much more can be said, but 
we see that when we come to God, we have to be, we have to, off, we have to come on the merits of the blood of Christ. There has to be a blood sacrifice. Water represents baptism. And once you've come, once you've been forgiven of your sins by the blood of Christ, once you've been baptized, you can enter into God's house, which is what the tabernacle is going to be. In the New Testament, God's house is the body of Christ, the church, or the temple of the Holy Spirit. You enter by the body of Christ through the cross, for Christ shed his blood, the altar, and through baptism. Then you can become part of the body of Christ. Wow. In the body of Christ, there's the table of showbread, which speaks of the bread of life, which is Christ. You were nourished in the body of Christ by Christ himself. The light, Jesus is the light of the world. And so we are illuminated and nourished as part of his body in the church. And then there's worship. Incense represents praise and worship. So that's what goes on in the context of being in, in, in the true church, the body of Christ. Coming in here is something the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10 says we can do also. We're not the high priest, but Christ the high priest has gone in and made a new and living way. He's our forerunner behind the veil, it says. And we are now able to come directly into the presence of God and have fellowship with him just like the high priest in the Old Testament. Now one thing that uh, I, I derived from A.W. Tozer some years ago is that this speaks of three different levels of knowledge of God, represented by the different light illumination. If you're out here, you've got natural light because it's an open air court. The sunlight is the only light they have to depend on. They don't have artificial light here. They have sunlight. When you're coming to Christ, the knowledge of God you have is from natural revelation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The invisible things are known by the things that are seen that he created. Natural light. Everyone knows there's a God, whether they're a Christian or not. But once you've come by the blood of Christ and baptism into the body of Christ, there's additional light. This lampstand, which represents Christ, the light of the world, or perhaps the light that's borne by the churches. Remember this, the seven lampstands in Revelation of the seven churches. In the church, the preaching and teaching, and, and of course now the Bible is a product of the church, and so we have the Bible too. We have that light. We have the light of revelation. It's not just natural light. We know God by by revelation light. But then there's the Holy of Holies where there's no light except God himself. And that's the deepest place of knowledge of God and fellowship with God that we, the writer of Hebrews tells us we need to enter in beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies. And that is so we can approach God himself and have a personal relationship with him. See out here, people are not in God's proximity much. People who are not Christians they have natural light to know there's a God. But until they come through the steps into the body of Christ, they don't have access to the revelation of God in Scripture and in, through prophetic words and things like that that we in the body of Christ have access to. God makes himself known to us at a deeper level in the body of Christ mm -hmm. than we could outside of it. But e even beyond what the church can reveal to us, God himself, in intimate fellowship with God himself, reveals more. I mean, when I go to church, I hear a Bible teaching, or I hear a prophecy, I'm learning something about God, something of value. Mm -hmm. Something that's not from nature, it's from revelation, but, but I need to, in my own life, have direct contact with God, too. I need to have direct fellowship with God. And that's what the Holy of Holies seems to represent, too, for us. Now, therefore, the New Testament sees in the tabernacle and the structure a picture of things spiritual, heavenly, things that are true principles of knowing God or worshiping God. Uh, this brief statement about it is of very little value in itself. Hopefully it is of some value. But I say, as you look at the tabernacle details more, and again, I do have some lectures on the tabernacle, 10 lectures on it. Uh, that is, you begin to see more and more about the spiritual things that the tabernacle depicts. But at the end of Exodus, therefore, they've gone through the, the Red Sea, they've come to Mount Sinai, they've received the law, they've built the tabernacle, God has inhabited the tabernacle, and then comes Leviticus, which entirely takes place during their encampment at Mount Sinai. And then in Numbers, that's 
the early chapters they're still at Mount Sinai. Then God begins, the cloud begins to move, so they they travel in in numbers. But this is where the narrative brings us to at this point, and that's where we'll quit. Okay. Uh, just, yes. How did they do it when they moved? Um, how did they take the whole tabernacle um, when it was so holy? Only the Levites were allowed to move it. No one was allowed to touch it except the Levites. Now, the Levites were one of the 12 tribes that were set apart for God. And um, Aaron and his family, Moses and Aaron, they were of the tribe of Levi, so they were a smaller group within the Levites. Aaron's family were the priests. So Aaron and his family were Levites, but they were special Levites. They were the priests. The other Levites were like the grunt workers at the uh, tavern. They would tear it down. They'd set it up. They'd transport it. Now, um, there were special ways that God actually told them to do it. When you, when you move, you first fold up the curtains, and, you, and these guys actually they divided the, the Levites into three different groups, and each one had special. One group carried uh, you know, the, uh, the boards. One group carried the curtains. And they didn't just carry them. They had ox carts. They had special carts set aside to move it around, so it was moved on wheels. But they'd have to actually disassemble it every time they moved and reassemble it. But it was such that it was a building that was, I mean, it wouldn't be the simplest thing. It's not like today where you take a tent and just throw it up in the air and it, and it pops open. And you, you, know, you know, you, it was quite, quite labor intensive to set it up and tear it down. But it was capable of being done multiple times. And so they had the Levites as sort of, the, I mean, that was part of their full-time job, was maintaining the tabernacle, tearing it down and moving it and so forth. Thank you. All right. Um, I loved, even though it was a super brief explanation about the tabernacle, I just love how there's so much, like, spiritual significance to things we see in the Old Testament that are shadows and types.